It was an, it old, was an old, wise, wise woman, woman traveling in Odessa, Odessa in the midst. midst. Traveling, traveling in an old rail, old rail car, car. Long, journey. long journey. As she traveled, she, traveled, she would speak, she would speak to the other passengers. passengers. They would listen. For the passengers, For the passengers in hints, hints, spoke, spoke evil with evil eyes. eyes. How looking How ill on Ill others on in our world. world. For the passengers, the passengers from Yalishtok, she, spoke, she spoke, the spoke with the evil tongue. Evil tongue. How speaking, How speaking ill of others in the world. For the passengers from Berlin, she spoke with evil ear. Now listening, now listening to Ill of others in the world. The world. And so it should, so happen, should happen when the train stopped stop and give take on a load take of passengers. On passengers. A young man, a young man in the car sat, sat down opposite them. Not knowing, Not the, knowing identity the identity of the wise woman, he began, began to speak his journey. His journey. Are you going for mints? You'll mince. hear words, hear of, words wisdom of wisdom from the same saying. saying. I am told her words are golden. Her golden. speech is with insight, dripping with morsels of erudition. The wise woman, wise woman not, wishing not wishing for him or to mute. To mute. Ah, the great, the great saint, saint is nothing. Is nothing. They, know they know he to the stories, to the stories of, her. of her. They veil the ordinary, ordinary rather and fancy. fancy. Taken aback, the gentleman, the gentleman slapped, slapped her full on the cheek. On the cheek. How they have we searched her name? Her name. The next, the next evening, evening, the wise woman wise stood, at the, stood at the pulpit in the old shawl of shawl of midst. Again, she Again, claimed she the perils of the evil, evil eye, the evil the tongue, evil and the evil, and the evil ear. ear. But into, but her, into words, her words cut the sound, the sound of a man, of a man sobbing. sobbing. There, among, there the, among the throngs, was the man, was the man in the train. Bring him, Bring to, him me, to me, he said, he said and, he was, and he was brought. Tell me, Tell me why do you weep? I weep, I weep for I slapped you. you. The very sage, sage I saw you hear. Weep not. Weep not. It, is it is I who should weep. weep. For you taught, you taught me, me my own lesson. An evil eye, an evil eye, tongue, and an evil, evil ear do as much, as much ill, ill when we look when we ill, look ill on, ourselves. on ourselves. How can, can we seek to improve the world and improve ourselves if we do not first think well of ourselves? And that day, and that day every, student every student from Minsk, from Minsk to Melbourne, to Melbourne learned, to learned to trust and trust treasure themselves, themselves to, believe to believe in their worth, in their worth and, to and to believe in their future, in their future success. success. So that short little um, fable is brought to you by our very own Nadine, who told a slightly different version of this story uh, about a month ago, and I heard it and quite liked it. But the general principle here is that I believe that each and every one of you has the potential to succeed, and not only succeed, but to excel, whether it's in computing or in another field where you take your algorithms on with you. Um, so I just want you to take that message for yourself and remember the harm that you do when you speak badly of yourself. All of you have the potential to do excellently here. You just have to take that step and trust yourselves. So for our final week, we have one last historical figure. This is Raj Reddy. He's actually a little less known, but still of significant importance. He was born in India in 1937 and was a faculty member both at Stanford, Stanford and at Carnegie Mellon. He won the Turing Award, much like all our other historical figures, in 1994 for his work as an early pioneer in AI. And specifically, the thing in AI that he was very substantially responsible for was speech recognition, so commanding robots through speech. And of course, uh, now, as with many of the large foundation models that we've seen and that we'll hear about in our guest lecture tomorrow, his dreams of what AI might, might, want to achieve, might one day achieve, many of them have become a reality. Now, also quite interesting is that Raj Reddy actually has very strong links to Australia. He got his master's in technology from UNSW and indeed was uh, worked in IBM Australia for quite a long time before moving to the United States. So that is our last uh, major historical figure, but we will see, I think, two more in the course of today's lecture. So we've got one or two more things to cover about optimization just to prep us for our discussion of machine learning tomorrow. And then we'll get into some extension content today um, before a, a recap of the class and a little talk about my research and Dr. Jan Jong's research in our very last lecture. 
So this was our last of our problem strategies. Remember, we had all these parad paradigms for designing algorithms. Another type of al algorithm that we might want to design is an optimization al algorithm. And these algorithms turn out to be at the heart of almost all of modern machine learning and what we also call artificial intelligence. So much of uh, these approaches rely on a quite a simple paradigm. The basic idea is we have some function that we want to predict. So let's call this function, and this will be a function of x. Now, x can be anything. x can be a vector, which is uh, a multi-component item full of lots of individual sub-items. For example, let's say that the component x is our Taylor Swift song, and our function y is what are the lyrics of the Taylor Swift song. Now, we could imagine that our function y, instead of just predicting the words for the given song, for, for the Taylor, specific Taylor Swift song, can, in fact, predict the words for any song if you put into, as input, the frequencies that make up the song. Now, this seems like a pretty complicated thing. What is the function that takes in frequency spectrum and gives out the words contained in that frequency spectrum? That must be a really, really, really complicated function. But by representing it in this way, we can then take the next step and say, you know, maybe we don't actually know what the real function is that will take any frequency spectrum and output the words contained in that. We need something a little bit more approximate. So instead what we do is we're going to build a model of this function. And our idea is to make a y hat that is as close as possible to the true y. So even if it gets a word or two wrong here or there, we, our aim is to minimize this error, to have as few words incorrect as possible. Now, we also have our x hat because we may not have a true representation of the real world. We might just have some, some things that we've extracted from it. So instead of actually being able to put in a 100% replica of all, the, of all the frequencies, remember we have to do this sampling process. We lose some information by choosing how frequently to sample the song. So we have an x hat that is our input that uh, represents some sampling from the world, and we have our y hat, which represents as good as we can get to the true function that we're looking for. Now, the goal of optimization is as you see new x hats, as you see new examples from the world, can you improve your function uh, f such that your predicted output is as good as possible. Actually, I made a few mistakes when I said that. Y is not the function, Y is the output from the function. Our function, we have our function f. And the goal is to get our function f to model as closely as possible the true function f so that our Y hat, our predicted output, as closely as possible matches the real output that we want to expect to see. So now there are two main categories of machine learning that we can learn about. So let's say you know the words of the song ahead of time and you know the frequencies and you have this for 50 different songs. Can you make your function better and better and better by using these examples in order to make a much better version of f, an optimized version of f that more accurately gets what you want to see? So the, by supervised, we mean we have some examples and we also know what the output for, from those examples should be. However, that might not be the only, we might not have examples to start off with. So there's another type of machine learning as well, which is unsupervised which is can you find the right way to tweak the model to make your output better and better, even if you don't have any examples to start off with. So an example of this might be, let's say we have a whole lot of web pages and we want to find out which web pages are most similar to each other. Now we don't ahead of time know which web pages are, the, are most similar to each other. In fact, we may not even have like a super good rule for similarity of web pages. So what we'll want to do is we'll want to cluster them. We'll want, them, want to break them up into, say, seven different categories, and each category should be web pages that are more or less similar to each other. So the goal there is we don't have an underlying ground truth, but we want to come up with some algorithm that as we run it, the clusters will become better and better to represent something that we kind of feel like a similarity when we look at the web pages in each of those. So just remember this paradigm for when we have our guest lecture tomorrow, and he'll come back to it. So how do we actually go about improving the function? Either, um, let's, let's stick to our supervised example for now when we have examples. Our examples might uh, give us initially a function that is somewhere at the top of the mountain. So if we compute the amount of error that our function has, it gets like 50 words wrong. 
And now if I tweak the function, let's say it's like a, a quadratic or a cubic or a quartic, it's got lots of parameters like A, B, C, D, and you can tweak those parameters. And the question is, if you tweak one of those parameters, can you find a way that takes you further down the mountain? What I mean by that is what is the tweak that you could do that lowers the error between what you pr uh, predicted and what you actually wanted by the largest amount? So let's say we had one tweak that would give us five words wrong, and we have another tweak that could do three words wrong on this example. We'll tweak it so that we get the three words wrong, and this will reduce our error and will take us a little further down the mountain where the height of the mountain represents our errors. And the goal is to get into the valley as much as possible so that our error is minimized. Now some of the challenges with this is if you get into a valley, it might not actually be the bottom of the mountain. It might just be a temporary dip. Like we can see that this lake over here looks to be the bottom, but what if this mountain is on top of a much larger mountain range? We might get stuck at the valley because no matter which direction we go, no matter what tweak we make, there's no direction we could go that would minimize our error further. And this is one of the big tricks in machine learning is to figure out a way not to get stuck in these temporary valleys and to get down so your error is as low as possible. And that's what Tom Drummond will talk about tomorrow. So this takes us to our very last full topic for the semester, and this is complexity theory. Ooh, very exciting. Traditionally taught at third year level in uh, Melbourne Uni or even at master's level, but I think you guys are pretty smart. You can handle some of it. So uh, sit back and enjoy some of today talking a bit about complexity theory and about one of the most significant problems in the universe, and we'll get to that. So the basic idea behind complexity theory, we've already been doing a little bit of this. It's to group problems into sets, and in each set will be problems that are similar in some degree of hardness. For example, we already have seen this with our asymptotic complexity, so we can say all functions that belong to the set of O of N. That's an example of something you might do in complexity theory, but the full field of complexity theory comes up with much cleverer ways of categorizing problems and we'll see some more of this today. So let's go back to our Sudoku. Now I know this was not super clear the first time. Again, this is kind of extension material, so don't worry if you don't 100% get it, but uh, try and stick along for the ride. So we had our grid, and our grid represents a, a normal game that you could play, but we also had another representation, another version of solving this problem. So either we could solve it using this like grid representation, or we could write it using these complicated logical statements. Now I remembered last time, I actually forgot to say what the, uh, the wedge looks like, this wedge symbol, and what the V symbol actually means. So if you haven't already taken a logic class, the wedge symbol means a logical and, just like we did with our bits. So if either of them is, if both of them are true, then you get a true from the and, and if one of them is false, then you get a false from the and. And an or is kind of the opposite. The, the upside down one is if either of the sides are true, then the full thing is true. So what we have on this thing is it's saying all of these individual things have to be true for the results to be true. And what I'm saying by, what I mean by starting assignment is I say a priori, I'm telling you that this entire statement evaluates to one. And what that means is each of the individual clauses must also evaluate to one. Each of those individual clauses must also be true. So it is the fact that S10 uh, 1 is equal to 0. That is a true statement. It's a true proposition. Even though I'm saying that something is equal to 0, you, that is a proposition. So if I say 0 is equal to 0, that statement, that proposition is itself true. That's a true thing to say. And so what I'm saying here is that this combined statement, all of these separate things combined together are true as well. Now you don't have to worry about how we construct it. If you want to go back a little, you can go to the other lecture and see. And then that was my starting assignment, the thing that I already knew was true. And these are the things which I also want to evaluate as, as true. They must be true as well. However, they don't give me any information about the current state of the puzzle. These are more, for a valid Sudoku, these must all be true. And here I've used a very large V and a very small V, and this is just a shorthand way of writing out a lot of individual clauses. Because as I said before, you got like 10,000 of those individual clauses. And so like the one at the very top is saying for every possible value of Y, and I see another typo, and for every possible value of Z, take the value of x, the value of y, or the value of z, and uh, 
construct your statements that way. Don't worry about it too much. It's just another way of representing the clauses. And so what we were asking, is there a combination of settings for our S, X, Y, Z? So is there a combination of our variables? And remember, our variables represented what number was in what cell, such that all the clauses can be satisfied. And what we mean by satisfied is that every clause is correct. So if the clause says that this thing is equal to 0, or that thing is equal to zero, that clause, that combination, that full logical statement must itself be valid. And by valid, it must evaluate to true. So this is a, a very complicated way of representing things, but we call it satisfiability. And we have a very nice paper, an academic paper, that showed how to convert any Sudoku problem to a SAT problem. So you could take your, your grid that you'd written, uh, that you see in the newspaper, and write it out as a combination of all of these clauses. So let's uh, take a step back from that, and we'll ask a question from the audience. Now, Ahmed, you haven't answered a question for a while because you've been filming, so I'm going to pass this, get someone to pass this one back to you. So this is a tricky question. And the question is, if I tell you the value of all the variables, can you tell me if it's a valid solution for Sudoku or not? What do you think, Ahmed? I think you could, yeah. You can? And how would you do that? How long will it take you? You will have to. Uh, how many squares are the Sudoku? There are 81 squares. But that just, that just helps us fill in the grid. How do we know if a Sudoku grid is correct? We will have to go through until we find like one that doesn't satisfy, doesn't, doesn't look like it, it, it fits the... Our various clauses, right? So we have each clause represents a condition that must be satisfied in order for the Sudoku, the solution to be valid. So if I have... Uh, a big string, let's say I have a string and it's made up of the clauses, um, and the string is of length n, can you give me a runtime for how long it takes me to check if a solution was valid or not? O of n? Yeah, it should be O of n because you just run through the string and you check at every, as you go along the string, is this part of the string correct, is this part of the string correct, is this part of the string correct, using the variables that I've given you. I've given you all what I claim to be are the correct values for all the uh, s, x, S, X, Y, Z, um, and if you know the values of S, X, Y, Z, that's just like evaluating, um, let's put it onto this for a second. If I say that S, X, Y, Z equals zero or S, uh, let me fix that up actually. Uh, if I say that S, zero, one, one, is equal to zero, or S012 is equal to zero. And I've told you that S01 is one, and S012 is zero. We can just go ahead and evaluate this by parsing the string. So first we check, is S011 equal to zero? No, it's not equal to zero. So this is false. Now we say we have an or, and so we have to keep reading. And now we say we see S012 is equal to zero. Is S012 equal to zero? Yeah? So then we get a true. And then we check this, false or true. Yes, at least one of them is true. Therefore, this whole thing is true. And we just run over the whole string, and we can do this in O of n time to check if a solution is valid. So we have a pretty efficient method of testing whether a solution to a Sudoku is valid. It's O of n in the length of the clauses. Now we spoke a little that there may actually be better ways heuristically to solve a Sudoku than writing it out in this complicated SAT form, but we at least have a, what, what I'll start calling a reduction, where we can take any Sudoku game, reduce it to a SAT problem, and then definitely know if it's correct or not if someone's given us a solution in O of n time. Now, because it runs in O of n time, we can also say that it runs in polynomial time. And what do I mean by polynomial time? It also runs in O of n to the k for some k. Now, remember, the big O is just a bound. So just like saying that um, n, n is, less than e or e is less than or equal to n squared for some positive n and n 0, et cetera, and for some c, we can say that O of n is a smaller class than n to the k. 
So it definitely, if it runs in O of n, it's definitely gonna run in O of n to the k. So it runs in linear time, yes, but it also runs in polynomial time. And we're gonna care about this because the set of things that run in polynomial time is gonna be very interesting to us from the perspective of what is a good task to make a computer try and do. So as I said, any problem that's O of n is also O of n to the, n to the k. So we can now say that sat, that satisfiability, this problem of with all the clauses and evaluating them to true or false, belongs to a class of problems, NP. And NP is just the class of all problems, it's the set of all problems that I can check if a solution is correct in polynomial time. So if you give me a solution, I can check if the solution is correct in polynomial time. So the checking procedure to check the solution runs in O of n to the k. So we say that Sudoku reduces to sat because no matter what puzzle, no matter what Sudoku puzzle you give me, I can always give you a version of the clauses that are equivalent to solving that Sudoku. So the only thing that would be different is the starting assignments because the starting assignments told us what's already on the Sudoku board and the clauses were just the rules of how a Sudoku game works, how to check if something is correct or not. That tells us whether a solution is valid or not, and the starting assignments were just what's the particular version of the puzzle that we're looking at. So in this way, Sudoku always can be reduced to sat. So if we can decide all sat problems in polynomial time, if we can figure out whether there, uh, is, there exists a solution or not, then we can definitely do the same for any Sudoku because we know that because we can convert a Sudoku into a SAT problem, if we can solve all of the SAT problems, then necessarily we must be able to solve all of the Sudoku problems. So SAT has actually given us this very powerful tool because any problem that we can convert into SAT, if we can convert that problem into SAT and we have a really good way of solving SATs, then we can solve all those other problems because all of those problems are in some, some sense um, either easier or at maximum as hard as a SAT problem. Um, now I'm being a little tricky here, I'm saying uh, if we can decide all SAT problems, and this is just to help us deal with some of the mathematical subtlety here, what I mean by decision is actually saying whether there exists a solution to this particular Sudoku or not. If we wanna get from whether there exists a solution to the actual solution itself, that takes a little more mathematical handiwork, but don't worry, it can be done. Um, so what about other problems? So this is great. We know that Sudoku reduces to sat. Are there other problems that reduce to sat as well? Are there other problems? If we can solve sat, are there other interesting problems in life that we could solve? Um, so here is one of them. Can you color the states with two colors such that no two states with the same color touch each other? Now, Ahmed, um, do you want to pass on the microphone to someone? Above Nick, a guy in the jumper, whose name I don't remember. Yeah. Malachi. Malachi. Yes. Okay, so what do you think? Can you color the states with just two different colors such that no states with the same colors touch? You wanna turn that on? No. Do you wanna explain why? Okay, I'll give you a, a bit of a hint. Yeah, so you can't color in South Australia. Yeah, there's no possible color we could pick for South Australia. Why? Because if you pick purple, then Northern Territory, it wouldn't work. And if you pick yellow or orange, then Western Australia would not work. Yeah, so there is no way of two coloring a map of Australia. That's what we call this, a two coloring problem. And it turns out this is a, a pretty easy problem to solve. There are very fast algorithms we can do that. Nope, we can't color Australia, we can't two color Australia. Okay, um, what about three coloring? Now, I'm gonna, I'll come back to you in a second. Everyone get out a paper or pen or something and see if you can give me a three coloring of Australia. I'll give you a minute for this one, a minute or two. Um, and note that the ACT uh, is part of this game. But 
Yeah. Okay, make South Australia its own color. Ta-da, that is the solution. So it turns out you just take the map we had before, you make South Australia the new third color, and you've solved the problem. And there I have the ACT in, uh, in the new color as well, just for fun. Could have been orange. Um, and Tasmania, we don't have a problem with it all. It could be whatever color it likes because it's not bordering any of the other states or territories. So now my next question for you, Malachi, is this problem in NP? That is, is there an algorithm, if I give you a solution, to check in less than O of n to the k time that the solution is correct? Yeah, and how, so I've given you a solution. Run, walk me through checking the solution. How many states are there up here? So there's seven states slash territories. Well, kind of, yeah. Well, eight, right? And then you could go through, say, going through one column and two columns all the way up to eight. So it's not through the colors, because we know we've only got three colors. But what we'll do is we can go through the states one by one. I've given you the solution. And for each state, we check the neighbors of the state. And we know that there are at most, uh, because there are seven states, uh, eight, eight states and territories in this map, each state could be bordered by a maximum of eight other states. So if the number of states is n, worst, worst case, we could get n squared things that we have to check. Because if every one is neighbored by all of the other ones, which is not really a realistic map arrangement, but in theory, if you could draw a map where every state was surrounded by all of the other states, you'd have to do n checks for each state. And there are n states to check. So you'd do n by n checks, n squared. n squared is big O of n to the k. And so this problem is in NP. We can check it in n, and worst, worst case, n squared time even for a crazy impossible map. And for a realistic map, it's going to be less than that, because each state is going to be surrounded by less than n other states. So the problem is indeed an NP. But it turns out we can reduce this problem as well. So we can represent our map as a graph, where each of the nodes is one of the states, and where each of the nodes receives a color based on the color of that state. And so now we can very obviously see the same kind of checking procedure as we did before. For any node, if you want to check if the for if you want to check if a given solution is value is valid, for every node, look at all the nodes to which uh, which are neighbors of that node, and make sure that they're not both colored the same way. And once you do that for the entire graph, you're done. Um, so we do it by examining each vertex's neighbors. And we can do this in our graph, graph representation in O over n squared, still polynomial time. Now, you might think we're done, but uh, I know you all are suckers for punishment. So we can convert this into a SAT problem, where we have, we're going to have a set of variables, our, our s variables. And our uh, s's are going to be um, from uh, representing each state, and here I've done for seven states, zero to six instead of the ACT, which I've ignored in this representation. Um, and our colors are going to be zero, one, and two. So states zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and colors zero, one, and two. And zero can be orange, one can be purple, and two can be green, and that's fine. And then what we can do is we can just construct a large logical statement that says that encodes all the same conditions that we had before. So let's take a look at a simplified version of it. Um, here is one of, our, uh, one of our clauses that we need to satisfy. And this says that node 0 must be at least one of the colors, because either S01 is true, or S02 is true, or S03 is true. So that's the same as saying node 0 must be green, or it must be purple, or it must be orange. So we know that this combined logical statement is true. And in this instance, uh, it is orange, so let's say that orange was one, so that's true or false or false, true or false or false, that whole thing is true. So this clause would be satisfied given this solution. But now we need to do that for each one of the nodes. We have, uh, oh, I, I did put in eight here, so the, it was the previous slide, I'll, I'll fix that up. Um, but we now need to write out one of these clauses for each of the nodes. So this is true about node 0, but I also need one of these for node number 1. And I also need one for node number 2, and node number 3, and node number 4. So I have a way to convert at least that part of the problem. Now, 
I also need my more complicated clauses, like we had with the Sudoku puzzle. I want to build up something more that tells us about this condition, not just that each node has to have a color, but that it can't be the same color as its neighbors. So this is a fancy way of saying node zero can't conflict with any of its neighbors, with any of the nodes to which it's connected. Um, and let's look just at the beginning. So if it is the case that uh, S00, so if it's the case that the zeroth node is orange, then it must be the case that node one can't be orange and node two can't be orange. So that's what I've written here. So let's look at just the start. Let's say, let's set uh, S00 to true for the time being. So S00 is true because node zero is orange. Then this second half must also be true for our solution to be valid. So because it's an and, which means we require that both sides of the and be true. So what does it say on the other side of the and? And we know this must be true. It says not S10 and not S20, which means it must be the case that not S10 must be true. So is S10 true or false? Malachi, do you want to pass the microphone to someone else? Pass it forward. Remind me your name again. Hui. Hui. Yeah. OK. So is S10 true? And remember, that refers to the first node, and 0 refers to orange. OK, so S10 is false. And I'd use this bar symbol here, that weird, I don't know how to do that. That bar symbol means not. So if S10 is false, what is not false? True. Not false is true. So is not S10 true? Yeah. yeah. OK, so that's true. And not S20, is not S20 true? That's also true. That's also true. So we get true and true and true. Now we have an or. And let's look at the or. The or says S01. S01 is this proposition that node 0 is colored green. Now, is S01 true? It's false, which means that this thing is false. OK, now let's look at the last one. Is S02, so S02 means node 0 is purple, is also false? OK, so let's uh, write it out on the iPad. What did I have there? I had the whole of the first thing evaluated to true, the whole of the second thing evaluated to false, and the whole of the third thing evaluated to false. But between them, I had ors. So what's the, res what's the result of this whole statement? Sorry, the, whole thing is true. the whole thing is true because with ors, you only need one of the different clauses to be true, one of the different components of the clause to be true. So as a result, um, this whole statement is true, and what's it, what it's actually encoded is that if it's orange, then it must be the case that neither of neighbors are orange. If it's green, then it must be the case that none of its neighbors are green. And if it's purple, it must be the case that none of its neighbors are purple. And so if we then carefully go through and write one of these out for every single node in our graph, and we do our starting assignments to make sure that at least that every node is at least one of the colors, then we've hopefully solved our problem. Which means that if we can solve all possible SAT problems in polynomial time, then we could definitely solve any version of the MAP3 coloring problem in polynomial time. Why? Because we know that we can take any MAP and convert it into the graph problem. And we know that we can convert this graph problem into the SAT problem. Therefore, if we can solve all the SAT problems that exist in polynomial time, that means we can solve all those graph problems in polynomial time, which means we can solve all the map problems in polynomial time. So this is giving us something even stronger. Um, and again, I've set it here. Uh, if we show that all instances of one problem can be, invert can be converted into another type of problem, we call this a reduction. Now, there are some catches around this. Uh, the, the conversion process also has to run in polynomial time, because if your conversion process takes longer to run than your actual solution process, you haven't gained anything. So our goal is to find conversions that we can do pretty efficiently. Um, so it turns out that Sudoku can also reduce to this graph coloring problem that we did. 
And if you want to have a bit of a hard think about it, imagine the Sudoku grid as a graph and see if you can kind of come up with that analogy yourself. So Sudoku reduces to graph coloring, and graph coloring reduces to satisfiability. So how far can we take this whole process? Turns out we can take it pretty far. So there are all these complicated computer science problems, and if we're clever, we can reduce all of them pretty much to SAT. In fact, uh, if you can solve the hardest of all of these problems in polynomial time, then you can solve all of these problems in polynomial time. Um, and so problems where that you can determine if a solution exists in polynomial time or not, we put them in a class and we call this class P, short for polynomial time. Now again, you'll notice I've made this slight subtle distinction between deciding if a solution exists versus coming up with a solution, but again, we're gonna, we're gonna leave that aside until you actually get to third year, but in some ways we can uh, just let that slide for the time being. So now you might be asking, well, so we have some problems that do this. What, is the overall, what does the overall ecosystem look like? So you've given me a bunch of very specific problems that reduce to SAT. What does it mean for the broader class of problems that exist in the world? So here we have another two Turing Award winners, and this is one of the crowning jewels of theoretical computer science, which is the Cook-Levin theorem, which says that if SAT is solvable in polynomial time, then any problem that is in NP, any problem that you can check in polynomial time, can also be solved in polynomial time. We don't know if this is true. This is, this is very unclear if it's true, but if you can solve SAT in polynomial time, then every single problem that you can also check in polynomial time can also be solved in polynomial time. And with the, with the caveat about this distinction between decision, deciding whether something has a solution, actually finding the solution. Now, this is so significant that I'm gonna say it one more time in slightly different words. If you can quickly check a problem, then you can quickly solve a problem. That is what this is saying. Now that would be really, really big in the world if it was true, because we know a lot of things that we can check quickly, but we don't know ways to solve them quickly. So this would upend everything, because this says anything that you can check fast, you should also be able to solve fast. And we know that already in our instances, in our re everyday life, this is pretty tricky. We know how to check a Sudoku pretty quickly, but solving a Sudoku takes us much more time. So this would be a pretty amazing thing. So this gives us a reason to suspect that perhaps SAT might not be solvable in polynomial time. Because if SAT is not solvable in polynomial time, then we don't get this magical solution property for all NP problems. So we're gonna call this NP completeness. And it is going to be a set of problems that we could use to solve all other NP problems. If any of the NP complete problems has a polynomial time algorithm that we can use to solve it, then we can solve all of the remaining problems in NP. Pretty amazing. So we now can draw this diagram of where different problems in the world sit. Which of these different categories do they sit into? So we have our category of all the problems that we can solve in, um, uh, all, all the problems that we can check quickly. So that's our big circle here, NP. All the problems that we can check quickly. We have all the problems in the world that are really, really hard and that if we solved any one of those, uh, we would be able to solve all the easier problems. And then we have this special category of NP complete problems. Now this is the problems we just talked about. These are the problems that number one, we can check quickly, but also number two, if we can solve them quickly, then would solve all the other NP problems. So there are some problems that are really hard. We can't check them fast, we can't solve them fast. If we could solve them fast, then we'd be able to solve all the easier ones, great. But you know, those problems are just super, 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 super hard. We can't even check them quickly. But there is a subcategory of the ones that we can check quickly, that if we could solve them quickly, then we could solve all the quickly checkable ones. Um, and that is our NP complete class. So there's a, big, a, a super big question. Is SAT solvable in polynomial time? And this leads to the biggest unanswered question in computer science probably, or at least what I would call the biggest unanswered question, is is P equal to NP? And what this means, is it true, if there exists one of these polynomial time algorithms, then P is equal to NP, and it turns out that we can actually solve all the NP problems really quickly. This is the world on the right over here, where, you know, in, re in reality, a lot of the problems that we thought are hard are actually not as hard. Then we have the other world, P does not equal NP, 
where some, of, some problems are quickly checkable and quickly solvable, some problems are quickly checkable and not easily solvable, and some problems are just really, really hard, and we can't check them quickly or solve them quickly. Now, in fact, there is a giant uh, pot of prize money uh, if you can solve this. So uh, as your final exam question, I'm assigning uh, does P equal NP, um, and along with an A plus, you'll also get a million bucks. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really recommend trying to solve this one. Most people who have attempted it, uh, sorry, most, most solutions out there come from cranks. And there's this wonderful page out there called the P versus, the P versus NP page, which is a list of all the crazy proofs out there that have cl claimed that they have a solution to this problem. Um, thus far, all of them have been found wanting, and there's a lot of effort being spent on debunking people, debunking people's proofs. You get a new one of these like every six months or so where someone's claimed to solve it. Um, but you know what, Dr. Connie, this, this all seems stupid. It, it's very theoretical. I mean, what do I really care about solving Sudokus? There are a lot of real world problems that are quickly checkable, but we don't have a fast way of solving. And here's a, here's a couple of them. So coming up automatically with, theorem, with proofs for a given theorem. So checking if a mathematical proof is correct is considered to be uh, in NP because assuming that you write it out the right way, you can just go through the steps of the proof and check each step of the proof. However, coming up with the proof is really difficult. Um, so if P equals, is equal to NP, then we can automatically come up with proofs for theorems. If P is equal to NP, we can do a lot better on optimization problems, like figuring out where to place cables for telecommunication networks. Again, there's a, a little bit of subtlety here because this is an optimization problem. Um, we could design better circuits. We could break cryptography. We could fix speed. We could get perfect speech recognition. We could do perfect timetabling, and I know all of us would be happier with that. Um, we'd be able to pack our backpacks perfectly every time. We could figure out if you're doing like an Uber share with a bunch of different people, the optimal route to pick up all the people. Um, but the last one some of you might be interested in, uh, if P was equal to NP, there would be an efficient way to steal Bitcoin from anyone. And so if you do have an algorithm for uh, solving one of these NP complete problems in polynomial time, the right thing to do is not to publish a paper on it. The right thing to do is steal everyone's Bitcoin. <laughs> um, and so I think that'll be the giveaway if any of you don't bother coming to the last exam because you're a multi-billionaire. So, all of these look like problems that we actually do kind of solve. And the question is, well, if they're NP complete, how do we solve them? Well, the answer is, is that we're actually just solving particular instances of the problem. So like with the graph three coloring one, where um, Malachi could come up with a solution to it, and I could come up with a solution to it, just because there is one of the instances of the problem that's easy, like an easy Sudoku to solve, doesn't mean that there's a generic algorithm for solving any Sudoku in polynomial time, and that's where the gap is. In fact, we've even got some ways to get like approximations of the right answer, as long as we're willing to relax some of our clauses, but that's still not solving this P equals NP problem. So if we could solve them all, the world would look pretty radically different. In fact, if, according to Scott Aronson, if P equals NP, the world would be a profoundly different place than we usually assume it to be. There would be no special value in, creati in creative leaps, no fundamental gap between solving a problem and recognizing a solution once it's found. Scott Aronson is probably the greatest living complexity theorist alive, and he also has this beautiful paper called NP Complete Problems and Physical Reality, which is really a bit of a physics paper. It talks about all these interesting things that the universe does that looks like it's solving NP Complete Problems, and he attempts to show that the inherent structure of the universe itself should make us skeptical about, um, about the uh, answer to this question being that P e does actually equal NP. So Scott Aronson is a skeptic. He says the nature of physical reality should lead us to conclude that some problems are hard and some are easy. Some are easy to check and some are hard, uh, hard to check. Some are easy to solve and some are hard to solve. So that closes us out on complexity theory. Now we've been through this whole semester of solving uh, problems from hard to easy. I want to take us back to one of our easy problems and actually try and tackle it from a number of different approaches. Now this problem uh, you will have seen a couple of times before. The human X chromosome contains hundreds of genes associated with a wide range of diseases including haemophilia and red-green colour blindness. 
An interesting aspect of the X chromosome is its inheritance pattern. Unlike the Y chromosome, where the number of possible ancestors must be equal to the number of generations, or the 22 other autosomes, where the maximum number of possible ancestors is equal to 2 to the power of the number of generations, X chromosome inheritance is a little more complicated. A male will inherit one of two possible X chromosomes from his mother, either from his maternal grandmother or his maternal grandfather. A female will also inherit one X chromosome from her father, introducing an asymmetry in the number of possible ancestors. Turns out there's an efficient way to calculate the number of possible X chromosome ancestors using the Fibonacci sequence. For a male, the number of possible ancestors is equal to the nth Fibonacci number, where n is equal to the number of generations going back. For females, this method can also be used, but n is equal to the number of generations plus 1. OK, so we have a real world problem about calculating the number of uh, X chromosome ancestors, and we have at least a kind of an algorithm for going about it. Now this puzzle is often used in industry interview screeners. In fact, there's one company that I won't name that uses this for every single person who comes through. This is the first question they ask them to see how efficiently you can solve it. And of course, our task here is to calculate the nth Fibonacci number. Now, I hope that all of you by now could do this pretty much in your sleep and come up at least with a sample solution. So where's the microphone at the moment? You want to pass it down one. OK, so what's, what's the obvious uh, solution to the Fibonacci problem? Uh, using yeah, using recursion. So I'm going to put this up here. This is our implementation one. It's manually set as our base case, f of 1 is equal to 1, f of 2 equals 1, and then the nth Fibonacci number is equal to f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. And this runs in O of 1.7 to the n, which is not great. That's exponential time. But it's very easy and quick for us to code. So here I have the, so I'm using long long, which is the largest type that C will natively support, because my Fibonacci numbers are going to grow big pretty quickly. I'm going to have my base cases here. And uh, if I'm not in my base case, I just do my basic recursive thing. So I'm just going to run this super quick. Which Fibonacci number do you want to calculate? I'll do the fourth one. Runs pretty fast. Let's do the 10th one. Let's do the 20th one. Takes a little while. OK, let's try the 50th one. Now it's taking quite a long time. You've seen this before, a bit of recursive code that isn't that efficient. OK, so we don't super love that solution. It's not great. Uh, wrong thing. We have another implementation. And this time, the way we're going to improve on, and I'll run through these a little quickly because we're already over time. Um, but the basic idea here is to save each value as you go. So if, I've cal if I'm calculating n minus, f of n minus 1, f of n minus 1 uses the answer from f of n minus 2. But because they're separate recursive branches, I'm actually ending up, I'm, rec I'm calculating f of n minus 2 twice. Because this part, f of, that's going to calculate f of n minus 2 eventually. And that's also calculating f of n minus 2. So I could make a table. And inside the table, I'm just going to store the Fibonacci values as they're calculated. And then when I get a new, when I start my Fibonacci function, when I start a recursive call, I'm going to look in my table and see if it's for a value that I've already calculated. So that'll help us save the effort because we have these two chains of recursive calls going on at once. This is my Fib2. OK, so I have something that I'm just calling memory. I'm going to uh, zero it out. And then I'm going to say if the memory, if the value in there is 0, then I haven't remembered anything yet. But if it's non-zero, then it represents a value that um, I have already done. And so I'm going to access it. So the basic thing here is I have my base cases. So if memory 1 is already set, oh, sorry, if memory 1 is not already set, set memory 1 to 1. Otherwise, check if the value for n minus 1 is in the memory. Check if the value 
the n minus two is the memory is in the memory and fetch it out. Now, um, you can I'll post these online and you can check them running. Um, but let's just see it go. Let's do the tenth one. Runs really fast. Let's try the fiftieth one. Also runs pretty fast. So we're already doing a lot better here just by uh, optimizing on our usage of not repeating the work that we're doing. Okay, we call this technique memoization, remembering temporarily some of the work that we've done before in order to make our program more efficient. So we also have a third version, and the third version is much simpler than versions one and two. It's just using iteration. So we've already talked in class a little about how iteration is often much more efficient than recursion, because when you do recursion, you're asking the computer to make a new stack for your new function call every time that you make another recursive call. So we can run fib3 and actually uh, o of n, or here I've used theta of n, which means it's both bounded above and below by n, which means it actually runs in n time. It runs in linear time. Um, and we don't even need to store all of that in memory, we're just calculating it as we go. Because we can keep track of what the current sum is and just add the prior numbers on. So that's a, a better way of doing it. What if we want to run our program a million times? Who's got the microphone right now? Yeah, go for it. What if we want to run our program a million times? What's an efficient way of uh, doing it? So like with the million different Inputs? No, some of the inputs will be the same, some of the inputs will be different. Are you could store it each time? Yeah, so this is our fib, kind of like fib2, except now we're storing the memory in a file. So instead of it being loaded every time the computer, every time the program runs, now we're going to make a program that loads in the memory from the file and has a whole lot of saved results for the different Fibonacci calls. So we're getting a little better here. So if you ever do a programming interview, they'll say, okay, write me, write me the stupid solution and you'll write the recursive one and they'll say, now can you improve it a bit? So we've seen already three techniques to improve it. Now, what if I wanna run it with really big numbers? Let's try this really quickly. I'm gonna run this on with the Fibonacci number 70. Okay. Pretty soon, if I start to put in big numbers, I'm gonna get overflow. You can see here it's unhappy. Let's compile fib3. Oh. And we can see our overflow is still happening for fib3. So we've got some kind of a, a fundamental problem because we can only represent, uh, we've only got long longs, which only gives us so many bits. So no matter what we do, we run into trouble we get a stack overflow, or an integer overflow, I should say here. But what if I do wanna run this with really, really big numbers? Then you're going to need some way of joining together all the different bits for two things, and we'll call this big nums. So f of n is approximately equal to this formula, but uh, we can actually take advantage of this formula, and there is a closed form solution to the nth number in the Fibonacci sequence. So all this while, we were bothering with this annoying algorithm to calculate the nth Fibonacci number uh, by iteration or recursion, when we could actually just put the numbers into this equation where phi is the golden ratio and come up with the nth Fibonacci number. So what's the runtime of this approach? Do you wanna pass the microphone down? Maybe deduction. I hope constant time. Constant time, why is it constant time? It's just a basic calculation. It's a basic calculation. So basic calculations should run in O of one time, right? Unfortunately, that's not really the case. This makes us very sad. It doesn't actually run in O of one time because our O of one time assumes that one operation take is just one step for the computer. But when our numbers get really, really big, when they're bigger than the word size of our computer, this isn't really true. In fact, our arithmetic and the operations we use are actually whether our, the way our multiplication uh, algorithm works or the way our addition algorithm works is going to become super fundamental to the runtime of our programs. So this exposes another layer of what's going on under the hood. So let's uh, check out our implementation for the Burnett's formula version. This is fib3. Which one do you want to calculate? Oh, that fib3, sorry, was the iterative one. Let's look at fib four. So 
This just implements Burnett's formula. This is the fastest ordinary way of implementing the Fibonacci, of uh, getting the nth Fibonacci number, just use the closed form solution. So this gives us yet another way of improving our algorithms. And if you pull this one out in a programming interview, I promise you'll really blow them away. But let's say you're a little bit cheeky. You want to really sh impress the interviewer and show the very most efficient runtime you can get. So let's, Emmeline's looking pretty happy. Let's pass the microphone all the way to her. And this will be pretty much the end of the class. Emmeline, what was the problem that we had with all our Fibonacci implementations up to this point? What was their main limitation? You have to help, uh, you help put it in the, micro in the microphone. Yeah. So say that again. What was the problem? Um, you don't have overflow. Yeah, we get integer overflow. Um, so roughly how many Fibonacci numbers could I fit before getting to in integer overflow? Uh, how many for them? Let's, let's look here, what was, what was the Fibonacci? Okay, so 100 was too big, so it's somewhere between zero and 100. So I have a maximum of 100 Fibonacci numbers. What is the most efficient way that our program could uh, give us one of the Fibonacci numbers? You can store all 100. You just store all 100 of the 100 Fibonacci numbers that'll store in a regular integer size. So if you're actually asked to solve this problem in an interview, you can pull out Fib 5. <laughs> Here I have the Fibonacci table down to the largest Fibonacci number that will fit in a long, long. And let's try the, there we go. Instant result pretty much. This, this truly takes O of 1. And so what's the lesson here? The last lesson that I'm going to leave you with for foundations of algorithms is that the real solution really depends on the real problem. Um, and we will, uh, I'll leave you with a few more wrap-up thoughts on Thursday. Thanks, everyone, and uh, enjoy the guest lecture tomorrow.